Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Christine Biglin from St. Mary's County Library. Um, I also have Brianna Thorne with me. And uh, tonight we will be taught, we will be hearing from Barb Whipke, who is the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited stores in Lexington Park and La Plata. And today we will be talking about how to create a winter refuge for the birds. Welcome, Barb. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hopefully I've met a lot of you already. And if not, hopefully you'll get into the store sometime soon. And so I'll hopefully get to meet you. Um, looking at the weather forecast, it looks like this is a very timely talk we're having tonight because it looks like we may be in for some snow soon. If you were watching your feeders today, you probably noticed quite a change at your feeders. Uh, the birds were definitely very, very busy at the feeders today. And my dad always told me when I was a kid, if you want to know what's going to happen, just watch the birds and they'll let you know. So I su suggest you maybe take some notes tonight and pay attention and get those feeders ready. So I am going to go to screen share here. Um, a lot of this I'll go through kind of quick, some of the, the foods information and then I'll show it to you when we're off screen so it will make a little more sense to you there. So creating a winter refuge. We're gonna talk about how you can turn your dreary backyard into a winter wonderland for the birds. Right now, our yards look pretty boring without any leaves on and probably a whole bunch of mud and rain out there after this last week. So we're going to brighten them up with some pretty bird colors. So who are we going to see right now? All of our usual visitors, those beautiful cardinals, our tufted tip mice, those cute little gray birds with that little tuft on the top of their head, goldfinches. A lot of people think the goldfinches leave during the winter. And actually, those goldfinches just molt into their winter plumage, which is kind of a all of drab color, but they are actually here year round. Carolina wrens, that's that cute little bird that wakes you up about 5.30 in the morning. The earliest riser and the most vocal bird out there that loves to sing lots of little tunes for you. The downy woodpecker, that's our smallest little woodpecker you see out there. The one with the red on the back is the male. The one without the red is the female. The red-bellied woodpecker, a lot of people confuse this one with the red-headed woodpecker because they've got such a pretty red head on the top. But that one with the checkerboard speckling on the back is actually a red-bellied woodpecker. If they ever turn just right so that you can see their tummy there, they've got an orange little tummy there. And that is the red-bellied woodpecker. A red-headed woodpecker will be a solid red, solid black, and solid white. It won't have any of that checkerboard pattern that you see on the red belly. Then our Carolina chickadee, this is another one that likes to trick us. A lot of us think we have black-capped chickadees. Here in Southern Maryland, we only have Carolina chickadees. And then our morning doves, we do not have turtle doves here. We have morning doves. House finches, the ones with the red on them are male house finches. The ones that are just the brown are the females. And then our good old blue jays that often get a bad rap, I'm here to defend the Blue Jays. They are the guardians of your yard. They're going to be the ones that's going to let you know when there's a hawk out there. They're going to let you know when there's a snake trying to get into a nest. So if you hear a Blue Jay carrying on, take a minute and pay attention. You wanna get a chance to see an owl. A Blue Jay is the great one to let you know when there's an owl hanging out in your yard. So instead of chasing those blue jays out of your yard, offer them some peanuts in the shell and invite them in to actually protect the other birds rather than looking at them as a bully. Yes, they will eat baby birds, but so will bluebirds. So will those beautiful cardinals. 
It's just that whole life cycle. But they also will protect a lot of those birds by chasing off those hawks. And then some of our northern visitors who are only here with us for the winter. So this is our chance to enjoy those birds. On the left, that's your white-throated sparrow. Easy enough to tell just by looking at that white throat. It's a real easy one to remember. If you look out there, they're usually going to be on the ground feeding unless you've been kind enough to offer them a tray feeder or a feeder that has a perch on the bottom. Something like this feeder is a cylinder feeder and then we've added a tray to the bottom. So by adding this tray, that allows that white-throated sparrow to now come up and dine. If I took this tray off, the, neither one of those birds actually could eat from this feeder now because they're what we call ground feeders. They're not able to cling like a woodpecker or a chickadee or a tufted titmice could. So we have to add that tray back on to allow those birds to eat or offer tray feeders. And then on the right is our dark-eyed juncos. You may have heard of those called as snowbirds because they're only here in the winter time. When you're looking at those dark-eyed juncos, if you see one that has more of a gray back or a, or I'm sorry, more of a black back, that's going to be the male and more of a brown back is going to be the female. But until you've looked at those a little bit, it's kind of hard to tell the difference on those. And then a few more of our winter visitors that are here. On the left is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. This year we are seeing a lot of yellow-bellied sapsuckers. So this is a great year to take advantage of getting to see those. They are a woodpecker, our only woodpecker that migrates here and spends the winter with us. They're larger than our downies, uh, closer to the size of our red belly woodpecker, but they're a much more round bodied bird. Their white kind of looks a little dingy like. Normally we say they don't come to feeders, but we are seeing them at feeders a lot this year. They're coming a lot to our cylinder feeders. If you haven't seen cylinder feeders, it's a seed cylinder that's kind of packed with a gelatin and then you just hang it on a feeder. They're coming to those a lot. In the past, they have always come to our bark butter feeders which is a paste that you just butter onto a tree. This particular one you'll notice is much redder than what's on that tree there. This one has hot pepper, so your little squirrely friends will not be interested in this one. Uh, but so you can put bark butter right on a tree or oh, there's a lot of feeders you can put it on as well. I like to slather it right on a tree and you can stick peanuts in it, things like that as well. So that's the yellow belly sapsucker. The one in the middle is known as a butter butt or a yellow rumped warbler. If you catch those from the back, it looks like they have a little pat of butter right on their rump. So they're, again, really easy to identify if you catch them from the back side because you're going to see that little spot of butter or you'll we'll look for the two little spots of yellow right under the edge of the wing. Um, that one's a little later in the year. So he's starting to put on its breeding plumage. So much more vivid colors than what you're going to see right now. And then on the right though, that's a pine warbler. Those we actually have here year round but I included them because they are going to stand out right now. I mentioned our goldfinches have molted into their winter plumage. So that is the bright yellow bird you're going to see right now is going to be that pine warbler. 
Notice the gray wing and the two white stripes. That's going to, that, those two white stripes and that pointed beak is going to be your clue that you're looking at a pine warbler. A goldfinch has more of a cone beak. A pine warbler is an insect eater, so it has a pointed beak. When you're looking at a bird, their beak will tell you, give you a little hint as to what they eat. If a bird has a pointed beak, it's an insect eater. So when you think back to like your woodpeckers, woodpeckers are insect eaters, so they have that pointed beak so they can get in there and snatch up those insects. So again, when you see that pine warbler, if you start watching your feeders, you're going to notice that you have pine warblers at them year round, but you've probably been thinking that they are goldfinches because they're about the same size, it's a little bit bigger, but it's not really obvious. You're looking at them, you're seeing them yellow, you're assuming you're looking at goldfinches. So start paying attention when you see a yellow one. Check the beak and look for those two white, white spots, stripes on the wing. Their wings will be gray where a goldfinch is going to be black. Okay, and then this year is not much of an eruption year. An eruption year is when there is a shortage of food in the Northeast and the birds have to migrate a little further south for food. Unfortunately for us, fortunately for the birds, they didn't have to come so far south to find food. On eruption years, we get really excited as we get to see extra birds and we get to see some cool birds. One bird that we are getting some glimpses of is the purple finch. A lot of people think purple finches are here year round and they are not. The only time you're going to see a purple finch is in the winter months and then that's not every winter. So right now you may be seeing some purple finches that one on the left is a purple finch. You're not seeing very many purple finches if you're seeing them. A purple finch looks different than a house finch. So take some time if you get a chance tomorrow and Google purple finch versus house finch and just look them up. The male purple finch actually looks like he's kind of chocolate and has been dipped in raspberry paint where our male house finch looks like he's brown and white striped and has some spots of red on him. When you actually look at them, they are very different looking. The purple finch is a much rounder body bird where the house finch is a sleeker body bird. And then on the right side is a male, I'm sorry, is a female on the left Okay, I'm sorry, on the tray feeder on the right, the left side of it is a female house finch, and on the right side of that is a female purple finch. So there you can definitely see that size difference. You'll also see that female purple finch has what looks like a sideways parentheses around her eye. But you can definitely on that photo see the difference in size. So watch, you may or may not. I have not been fortunate to see any purple finches yet. I have one of our new smart feeder cameras yet. If you haven't seen that yet, it's pretty cool. It's a feeder that takes pictures every time a bird comes to your feeder. And so trust me, I have been watching that diligently. I'm seeing lots of house finches at it and I have not seen any purple finches at mine. One of our team members here, um, he has seen some purple finches at his. So they're out there in some locations. So keep an eye out. So what to feed? You want to choose some different varieties of foods. This time of year, birds are looking for higher fat foods. 
because it's colder out there, higher fat foods are going to give them a bigger bang for their buck. If they can eat higher fat foods, they don't have to eat as much food. They're losing a lot of their body weight overnight trying to stay warm. Again, I mentioned that camera feeder. My birds are at my feeder before daylight. I have been surprised to see that, that they're showing up on that camera feeder before seven in the morning. Again, because it's so cold at night, they have got to get out there and get refueled first thing in the morning. So some high fat foods to feed. Winter Super Blend is a product that is actually just blended full of high fat foods. If you wanted to try to duplicate this, you're going to be looking for things like peanuts, nuts, sunflower chips, anything that's high in fat. Second on the list there is peanuts. Tree Nutty Plus is another food that I have in my feeders year round. I call it my woodpecker blend. In addition to peanuts, it has tree nuts in it. So obviously another high fat food. Um, that one has raisins in it. So I do caution people with a Tree Nutty Plus. If you're feeding that where your dogs can get to it, you do not want to use the Tree Nutty Plus. Raisins are toxic to dogs, so keep that one away. No Mess Plus is another good option. Again, peanuts, tree nuts, cranberries, cherries, uh, bark butter bits, which is a suet nugget. And then choice is another type of food. Again, you have the peanuts in there, sunflower chips, uh, sunflower in the shell. So look for some type of blend that you can offer your bird that have peanuts in it, tree nuts in it, some suet nuggets, a variety of high fat foods. So that's going to be something that you put in a feeder that's always going to have food in it. Those birds know that first thing in the morning before you get up, they can come to that food feeder and there's going to be food in there. So that one you're going to, that's what we call a foundational feeder. That's a feeder that's never going to run dry. Birds like our house finches never forget where to find a meal. So they know that no matter how hard it gets out there, they found your feeder once, they know there's always gonna be food in there. So in that foundational feeder, you're going to keep a variety of a seed blend that's high in fat. Then a suet. You want to choose a minimum of two to three types of suet for your birds. It can be the traditional suet cakes that everybody's familiar with. But when you're looking at your ingredients for suet cakes, make sure you take some time to read the ingredients. The first ingredient on your suet cake should be suet. And then your next ingredient, you want it to be another high fat food. In this case, it's peanuts, mealworms, almonds, pecans, walnuts. So all of those are high fat foods. And then this one also has calcium in it, which is to help the feathers. So take the time when you're picking up suet to actually read the ingredients, not all suet is created equal. I picked up a suet one time and it was called orange suet. And so I picked it up to see what the ingredients were. And it was, I can't remember everything that was in it. It was suet and corn, which is not a good food to really be offering the birds. Your squirrels will love it though. And cherry flavoring. Birds do not have a sense of taste. So guess who that cherry flavoring was in there for? That was the consumer. But the funny thing is they were calling it orange suet and putting cherry flavoring in it. So it's actually quite interesting. The next time you're in the store, just pick up a suet and read it. You'll be surprised what the ingredients are in that. So when you look for suet, 
actually take the time to read the ingredients. You're not looking for them to be filled with oatmeal and corn and milo and millet and things like that. You're looking for high fat foods in those suets. Uh, suet cylinders is another good one. This is actually the same as that suet, except this one you will find has some oats in it down toward the bottom. The reason those oats are in it is to help make it a no melt variety. So this one you can use year round without concern of it dripping down the side of your feeders. And just by the way, those varieties in the summer months, we switch those out to a no melt. So you probably wouldn't notice other than you'll see a little banner changes on it that says no melt. If you shop on our website, you'll see that we have both regular and no melt year round just because we don't want it dripping on you. So suet cylinders, suet balls is another one, which are just some little balls that you can put in feeders. It's another way to get suet into them. Bark butter bit. You may also hear this called bird crack in the store. It's a soft little nugget. I know it looks like dog food in the packaging, but it's actually a soft nugget. This is great because the birds can just grab it and take off with it. So if you've got predators or something around, it's a good one. In the spring, you're going to see them grabbing it and using it to feed to the baby birds as well. That bark butter, we talked about that one earlier that you can put right on trees. The newer food that we have, which is a great one to use as well, is the bluebird bugberry blend. Um, any of you that are in our club you probably got this one when you renewed your club membership or when you joined, if you joined within the last few months. That's another great one to be using for winter months. But like I said, any suets, just read the ingredients and look for ones that are high in fat. Niger or Finch blends. So we talked about those finches being here year round. So Niger and Finch are a couple of really high fat foods as well. Mealworms are another good one. And then the cylinders we talked about as well. Tube feeders are a great way to feed in the winter because they are very easy to clean. The more variety of feeders, birds not only have a favorite yard, but they have a favorite feeder in each yard. So you're going to have some, we talked about that prefer to eat from trays. Some like our woodpeckers tend to prefer to cling. So they're going to look for cylinders or feeders that they can cling from. This particular one that I showed earlier, those woodpeckers and birds that cling love ones like that. That one there on the right is a squirrel proof one. So obviously that one works really well if squirrels are an issue, but just offering a variety of bird feeders and then a, vari a variety of food is going to help bring in those birds. Suet so up there on the left, that's the traditional feeders that a lot of you are going to be familiar with for the suet cages. But you can also find the feeders around that have styles like this. You'll see tail pops hanging down. When woodpeckers eat, they use their tails for balance. So watch when you're out and about for suet feeders like this, which will invite in those larger woodpeckers because then they can cling up here, they can prop those tails for balance. Blue jays, I talked about those earlier. They love peanuts, but they particularly like peanuts in the shell. And then any type of little cup feeders, some of your birds really prefer eating from smaller cups. So just little cups like that that you can put little treats or mealworms, small things like that in will entice. If your feeders are really busy during a snowstorm or something, 
it will still bring in those birds and give a variety of birds more places to eat. Obviously this was not this year. Uh, so again, uh, just a variety of feeders that are going on there. That feeder on the right was our dinner bell, which was a very popular feeder. For those of you that had that feeder, we do now have a replacement for it and it's metal. So that one we had problems with over time, the plastic would crack. So we have a replacement for that. With this one, you can put the cylinder on it, but then you have a tray for that as well. So this one is nice because you can do both. So those birds we talked about that need tray feeders, this one you can do both. You can have your clingers, you can have trays. So look for multi-purpose feeders that allow you to feed a variety of birds. So you bring in those ones that like to cling, you bring in the tray feeders, look for ones with weather guards, things like this that are going to close down and help keep your seed dry or keep the snow off of them. Okay, and then water and shelter. So where I live, it's a very heavily treated area. It's not an area where bluebirds should ever be. That picture on the left is my backyard. One time, gosh, it's probably been about 18 years ago, I asked for a heated bird bath for Christmas. And that was the heated bird bath I got. That year, I got my bluebirds. <laughs> the reason you can entice them in is bluebirds are water-loving birds. So they are looking for a place to find water. If you live in a neighborhood with 10 people and you are the only one that has water in the winter, guess who's going to get the bluebirds that winter? they're going to head to your house. So you're going to add the heated bird bath. Then you're going to add a house for them. They will use a house for roosting in. The entire family will live in that house for shelter. Now you've been offering them all these food choices. So come late February, when they're ready to nest, they've realized there's no reason for them to move on. So a pair of those bluebirds will decide to use that nesting box and stay there and nest. And you start creating your bluebird population for your yard. So we have told many customers, if you want your bluebirds, get a heated bird bath, have it set up in the winter, and many of our customers have started their populations out by bringing them in in the winter time. So when we say heated bird bath, if you put your hand in there, it is not warm. It's just going to keep it from freezing. So it's thermostatically controlled. It's going to click on and off. As you can see, there's plenty of snow around there. Birds need to keep their feathers clean in the winter. They pluck their feathers up and form pockets of insulation, kind of like the down on a jacket. So if those feathers aren't clean, they're not going to be able to stay warm. So they not only need that water for drinking, but they need it to be able to get down in and bathe. So you do need to have a place where you can plug that bird bath in. You can also, if you already have a bird bath, you can actually just add a heater to your current bird bath, something like this. But you have to plug it in. Solar is not an option just because we don't have enough sunlight in the one winter months to be able to gather the solar to operate these and keep it thawed. But just an extension cord like you would use for your Christmas lights, run it out there. A lot of people will use the, a heated bird bath and just unplug it in the spring, plug it back in in the fall. 
On the right is a roosting pocket. It's just a silly little thing like this, and the Carolina wrens love these. These you can hang right up on your front porch. Carolina wrens really love to be around our house, so the closer you can hang it to your house, the happier those little Carolina wrens will be. Um, if you've left a nest, or I'm sorry, if you've left a wreath out on your front porch, you've probably come home to find them sleeping in it or seen them up on the ledge of the porch. So these little roosting pockets are great. We also have these beautiful boards. These I recently found just before Christmas. These are grown and hand painted by the Amish out of Lancaster, PA. I don't know if you'll be able to see those, but we've got a bunch of different ones. I just brought another load of those home last weekend. So these are another one. These are large enough that bluebirds and smaller can get into these ones. Those are good ones to offer. So any shelters that you can offer to help keep them warm. You may not notice them going in them at night because a lot of times they go in after dark. You want to be able to see if somebody's using them. Just take a little piece of pine straw and just kind of lay it against the entrance and watch and see in the morning if it's been adjusted. And that'll give you a clue if somebody's been using it or not. So a good variety of foods and a good variety of feeders will bring you a good variety of birds. And then you can sit back and enjoy the ship. Was there anything that you couldn't see that you need me to hold up again? Or any questions, Kristen? Um, yeah, I didn't see any come in, but but I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, now, the roost, what you use for a roosting basket or like you had the gourds, so you don't have to clean those out, right? So it's, they're Correct. different than- As long as they yeah. only roost in a, them, you don't. And typically they would only roost in those. But occasionally on the gourds that I showed, they occasionally might decide to nest in these. Um, I have a couple of these and my Carolina wrens did decide to nest in those last year. So with those, you can just take a piece of metal and just go in and pull out anything. And then if you need to just hose it off in there. Okay, um, but I guess you don't have to clean out the the little roosting baskets. No, the like roosting they don't... baskets are so small that they should not nest in those. Oh, okay. Yeah, they are. And for roosting, for roosting, they don't take anything in there. They just go in and sleep. The two of them, Carolina wrens, are one of our birds. We talk about birds that mate for life, but typically when they mate for life. They are only together during breeding season. Carolina wrens, however, they stay together 365 days out of the year. So we will watch our Carolina wrens go to bed together every night. So we'll be like, oh, they're going to bed every night. We have this conversation and you'll see the two of them go in there and go to bed together. And we also, if we have like a really cold, snowy, windy period, we'll see them during the day go in there together too to get out of the shelter or to get into the shelter. Uh, yeah. I, I think Carolina wrens are my favorite. I love them. <laughs> I think they're so sweet and they're so loud. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. like I hear something making all this noise. It's like it's all coming out of that little tiny bird. I know. You're expecting this great big bird. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, so Kathy said that grackles are wiping out her feeder sometimes. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So grackles can be annoying. So there's a couple things you can do. Um, one of the biggest ways to defeat grackles are with safflower. It is a, so in saf, I'm saying safflower, not sunflower. S-A-F-F. L-O-W-E-R. Safflower is a very hard white shell. 
So it's, the grackles have a gape at the back of their bill and they're not able to crack that shell. So what you do is put all safflower in any of your feeders that do not have a cage on it or that you cannot close down. Like this particular one that I mentioned, you can take your cylinder out of here and put a small one in and then this lid would drop down small so only your small birds can get in here. So that one you would be able to use regular food in and just close it down. But everything else you're going to put safflower in or put cages on. Chip, could you grab me a caged feeder? So you're going to cage everything or put safflower in. it. Once the grackles realize that you have nothing for them to eat, they're going to move on to your neighbors. So this is one of our caged feeders. With this, the car, I'm sorry, the grack, anything smaller than a cardinal cannot get through here. Mm. So you could put regular food in this. The, your other feeders, you would put the safflower in. The great thing about it is cardinals love safflower. So those other feeders that have the cardinal, that have the safflower, the cardinals would just move over to them. So there's definitely solutions. If you want to take a picture of the current feeders that you have and bring it into the store, we can work with you on solving all your feeders issues, figuring out whether we can cage any of them, whether we can close them down or whether safflower is the way to go for each of them. But yeah, we can definitely solve the grackle issues. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, sure. Oh, and I wanted to say your photos are fantastic. Oh, I thanks. noticed that you like have your bar with, they're really wonderful. You do a nice job with those. Um, okay. I had a question when you were talking about bird baths. Mm -hmm. um, there is a concern about having standing water in your yard because it attracts mosquitoes. So what can you do to counter that? Right. So this time of year, obviously that's not an issue. In the spring and summer, we have water wigglers and we also have mosquito dunks that you can put in there. Mosquito dunks, dunks are these little tablets that are harmless to the birds, but they do not allow the, the mosquitoes cannot lay in there and reproduce. And with the water wigglers, it's moving water, so the mosquitoes cannot reproduce in there but birds are also attracted to moving water. So it helps to bring in more birds as well. So oh. it's basically just this little thing that slowly stirs the water. Oh, that's nice. And then it's just electric, like you would- That one um, is actually battery. Oh, so okay. It's a, I can't remember if it's a C or D battery, but I will take a C, D battery. And mine lasts me all season, one- the battery oh. lasts me the entire spring and summer. Oh, that's nice. So, but that you cannot use in the winter months, but obviously mosquitoes aren't an issue now anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully not. I, yeah. I think I saw some things starting to bloom. Like, I mean, I saw a bush with forsythia, like yellow things coming out of it today. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know. I'm like, wait a minute. It's I think beginning. that's going to change pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so early in January. It bothered me. Um, okay. So I'm sorry. You said the tablets are mosquito Mosquito dunks. dunks. Yeah. And how long do those last? Do they dissolve pretty they, fast? They slowly dissolve, but it, it takes quite a while. Like weeks and weeks. Oh. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. It's a big size. So when you clean your bird bath, you'll just take that out, empty your bird bath, clean it, put fresh water in and lay it back in there. Oh, great. Um, and is that, okay? I guess that's okay for animals too? Because yeah, sometimes absolutely. I do see yeah. like other things drinking out of the yeah. um, bird bath. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, thanks. Um, you and I were talking a little bit and um, I appreciate you talking about like how to identify some of the birds that we're seeing now. Like that was very helpful. Um, and I think you also had mentioned, but I don't think there was a picture of it, the ruby crowned kinglet. That's something yeah, we might so be seeing. Ruby crown kinglet is another one that we're seeing a lot at feeders this year. 
So if you see this little tiny bird that's smaller than our chickadee, typically our chickadee is our smallest bird we're seeing at the feeders. If you're seeing a little one that's kind of tinted yellow, it's smaller than the chickadee, look to see if it's got a white eye ring. That most likely is a ruby crowned kinglet. It's called a ruby crown kinglet that it, because it's got a little ruby crown that you're most likely not going to see. <laughs> the only time it shows that ruby crown is when it's agitated. And if he's at your feeder, he's probably not agitated. He's thrilled that you, unless your feeder's empty. Um, but he will sometimes pop it up if, you know, somebody's agitating him or the feeder's gotten too crazy busy. But that's another one that's coming a lot to our feeders. They will come a lot to the trees for bark butter. So if you're regularly putting that bark butter on a tree, we see them, them, the yellow belly sapsucker, black and white warblers, and brown creepers, those four will religiously come to trees for bark uh -huh. butter. So if you get in the habit, if you find a tree and start putting that bark butter on there and you're faithful about putting it on there, you will start to see some of those birds that don't typically come to feeders coming there. However, this year we are seeing yellow belly sapsuckers and ruby crown kinglets a lot coming to our cylinder feeders. Oh, this is very timely because now I know what it is. I was trying to figure out it was a kinglet. So is it just the male that has the ruby crown or do they both? Um, if if it's there. I mean, like if they're mad. Hmm. Actually, that's a good question. I'm not sure I, if I know that or not. Yeah, I I'm guess because you usually don't see it. So I know um, exactly when yeah, they're happy. Like, <laughs> right. Oh, well, that's cool. Oh, good. I can mark it in my new bird book that I got there for Christmas. Go. Yeah. So that's awesome. So, so here's an interesting thing is they may not be in your Maryland bird book. So that's something you're going to find is in that Maryland oh. bird book. Some of the books, some of the birds you see will not be there because they're not here year round. Oh, so oh, you may okay. find that sometimes that when you're looking in that, hey, Chip, grab me one of the yellow bird books. So the the book that she's mentioning, I was looking it up. This one that she's mentioning is this little one, but it's a great book. It's color coded. If you're out there and you see a book a bird with red on it, you can flip to the red section. But the funny thing is that sometimes these birds that we see a lot aren't in here because they're not here year round. Oh, okay. So keep that in mind, too, that you might see something that just might not be here because it's not a year round bird. Oh, sure. Like, okay. I don't think I'm not positive, but I would guess are the hummingbirds are not in here, probably. Because they're oh, here they're in the not. summer. Yeah, OK, they just OK. My great here for the summer. So, yeah, keep that in mind, too, that they're not always going to be in there. Mm hmm. Um, <laughs> The female does not have the crown. Oh, thank you. On the ruby crown king. Okay, now we know. Awesome. Yes. And that's kind of typical that the males mm. are the prettier because the females are nesting. We want them to be more inconspicuous. Right. Um, oh, so, yes. Yeah, so uh, you and I were talking just a little before the show that, that right now, um, if people are interested, they can be part of the Project Feeder Watch because that is that is active right now. Like if you want to be a citizen scientist, you can um, yes. be part of that. If you could yes. just say a little about what that is for people who might not have done it before. Yeah, so uh, basically you're going to sign up through Cornell Lab. Um, if you just go to Project Feeder, just uh, go to Cornell Lab through Project Feeder Watch, you'll register for that. And basically you're just going to watch and count the birds that you see. Um, and it just helps to give them an idea of what birds are being seen. If we can get an idea of birds that may be in decline, um, it just kind of gives us a clue of, you know, what the the birds are looking like out there. So, you know, who better than those of us who are sitting watching the birds to let the scientists know 
what it looks like in our backyard. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, if anybody does have a question, you can also unmute yourself and just ask straight out if you don't want to type it into the chat. All right, not seeing anything new. So, um, Barb, I very much appreciate it. It is always wonderful um, for you to share all that you know and uh, to show us, you know, all of the examples. It's really, really great. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody who came because it's really nice that you're uh, willing to share your time with us. That's um, the most precious commodity we have, I think. <laughs>